Well, good morning. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, great to see everybody here this morning and so many uh, familiar and friendly faces out here. My objective this morning was really to try and give us a little bit of an overview of the entire area, if that's possible, uh, just to help get, I think, some of the basics out of the way in a conference like this. Um, I might point out that uh, if you want more detail, of course, Michael has brought out his new book, Michael Lloyd's on Central Bank Digital Currencies, and I'm delighted to have a, a signed copy. Um, and our objective today, as you know, is really to discuss this CBDC uh, revolution. So let's get to cracking at it. Um, as uh, Chris said, we run a think tank at Zien, and we've been involved in this space really since about 2007, 2008 when we began a, an initiative called Long Finance, which is looking at how would we know our financial system is working. And that immediately brought us into contact with things I hadn't anticipated, which was, you know, what is the nature of money and, and how, what, how does it matter? And we began bringing out some reports. Probably the first proper report in this space was in 2010, where I worked with Malcolm Cooper, and we brought out a report called The Eternal Coin, trying to look at was there some type of way in which we could base our fundamental monetary system on something solid. Uh, many, many others have been through that, not least Newton and Locke. Uh, many of you will refer to Keynes and the, uh, you know, his work on the Bancor, etc. Uh, but this is really where we began, was in an intellectual journey. Um, our research continues to this day, and I won't go through it, but what many of you will know in this audience is that we do probe a whole bunch of areas in the fintech space and a lot of areas in the AI and mind mapping space. And we also do, of course, a proper scientific research on things like low, uh, sorry, low loss, high voltage cables and things. So what would I like to cover today? Well, the first thing I'd like to do is just go back and have a quick recap of where we got to in 2010 in that publication, The Eternal Coin. I'll do a quick recap on digital money, which I think is there. And then, given the title that I've chosen, I certainly will be criticizing cryptocurrencies um, and gold, for that matter. But I will make some speculations about CBDCs and what would we today like to think a rational policymaker ought to do to approach the risks and rewards in this space. So let's start off with the Eternal Coin. The Eternal Coin, uh, as I said, was a booklet that we produced, and to get to the chase, we looked at five basic areas that money could be based on. Uh, could it be based on commodities? Uh, could it be based on trust? Uh, the book came down really with no particular axe to grind, but did imply that property was probably the best one that you, you could relate to. But it was in the course of that that I found that we had to define money. Now, you'll know that there are uh, many traditional definitions of money, and I'll come to a few in a moment. But one of the problems in this space is that no economics textbooks really begin with the definition of money. And given that my background is physics, I find that a bit surprising. You know, it's as if we were discussing physics and we hadn't bothered to define an electron or a neutron or a proton. We would be in, in deep trouble. Those of you who are physicists will realize that those things are still open uh, to definition. Uh, but we do try, as opposed to just ignoring it and saying that's exogenous to the system. Um, so I think you've got to think to yourself, what is this eternal coin? And the second thing is, when we began uh, this project in the late 2000s, I had a number of people in from various investment management firms. And when you begin to think about an investment management firm, they're actually saying that they provide an eternal coin, whether they do or they don't. But yeah. Give us your money, and we'll ensure that it doesn't lose value. That's pretty much the pitch, isn't it? Um, and you begin to say to them, well, how much can you guarantee that I shan't lose value? And they come up with all sorts of, well, we could hedge it this way. Obviously, diversification is important, blah, blah, blah. But the truth is, there is a promise, but there's no certainty. And the minute you begin to look at it, you, you realize you, you've got to make a stab at defining it. Now. I've always loved this one, money is a matter of functions for a medium, a measure, a standard, and a store. Uh, and that was William Stanley Jevons. Um, there were many people in the middle of the 19th century who set their minds to this, uh, both in, in Britain and in America. And this is the one that is, seems to have stood kind of the tests of time. Uh, 
at first, you, you begin to think, do I really need four functions? Surely it's really just a, a medium and a measure of value. But actually, the standard in the store, the more you begin to think about it, become very, very important. Um, the standard in the sense of how do I look at a debt over a long period of time, and the store uh, is the idea that there's some sort of future consumption. Um, now, it becomes intriguing as well that the measure bit, the unit of account, frequently isn't used. So if I said to you, for example, um, I have here uh, a wonderful mahogany table that you can take home, and you look at it, you're already thinking to yourself, I wonder how much that table's worth. You're beginning to equate that table into how much time you would spend to earn it. You're beginning to think to yourself, how will I get it home? Will I need to hire a van? What are the costs of it? You, you immediately go through all that in your head, but there's no financial transaction. So money does become a measure of societal value, uh, whether we like it or not, and often in unseen ways. So what definition did we come up with? Well, I believe that actually money is a technology. Money is a technology communities use to trade debts across space and time. And this has a particular importance to me because it founds money in terms of community. The community word is important. Uh, anthropologists, and I'll, I'll, I'll give a nod here to David Graeber and his great book, Debt the First 5,000 Years. Uh, Graeber points out that anthropologists have long defined communities. Uh, we today are not a community. We're a bunch of people who got together, uh, and that's nice, etc. But if at the end of the day we've all agreed to do something for each other, we've become indebted. And that indebtedness is what constitutes a community. So to anthropologists, Community is not a friendly word. Community starts with debt. Uh, communities are coercive. Uh, and you begin to realize that you are not in a community just because it's a joyful occasion, but it's often forced on you. We have semi-coercive communities, and I'll come on to an example of that in a moment. So communities begin to trade debts. Now, most anthropologists would argue that, broadly speaking, uh, single villages, everything's largely held in common, typically within some type of a power structure. Across multiple villages, there are typically issues of exchange of debts that uh, people would like to see. But that exchange of debts is typically about social relations. And there's very rarely in a, a, the next the neighboring village where I'm related to somebody a need for me to go and use money to do anything economic like buy or sell chickens or anything like that. If chickens are in short supply, they're probably in short supply in all the villages because there's a drought or because there's a lack of food. Uh, we really don't need that type of economic trade. It's only when we get to much larger groups than a village that we begin to see what we in the West would typically say is real money. Uh, again, I'll come on to real money in a moment. However, um, in social relations, there, are, there is a need for various types of debt uh, ex exchange and transactions. Now, most debts in a village can be handled uh, mentally. It's not difficult for me to work out that uh, I owe Alistair three chickens or, or that, I, uh, that I owe Sean uh, four cows. That's, that's fairly obvious, and we'll remember that. But it's when those debts become tradable that then the problems begin to start, and we need a more sophisticated system. And so money has been uh, used in social occasions across villages and then migrated, as Graeber and the anthropologists would say, into economic relations. And this migration towards economic relations is one where it's about the tradeability of the debt. Um, the example I always love is tally sticks, uh, arguably one of the great distributed ledgers of all time. Uh, so these were invented by the Romans, adopted across northern Europe, and uh, are really uh, quite an intriguing uh, story behind them, uh, principally because the tally stick was a typically a box, a piece of hazelwood or boxwood, these two woods that are very easily split. We'd mark up who owed what to whom, split the stick, and then I'd hand it, uh, we'd hand a copy to each other. But that stick could go around, and so I've, I've given my stick to Janet because I owe her a pig. She trades it around the room. Nine months later, um, Mary comes back and says, Michael, you owe me a pig. And I'm like, who the hell are you, Mary? <laughs> Uh, it doesn't matter. I've got the stick. So I give Mary the pig. We match them up. We break the sticks. 
It was an inordinately popular system. In the city of London, we still have a right called the ceremony of the quit rents. It's the oldest legal uh, right in, in the United Kingdom, dating back to about the 12th century. And we still celebrate the need for us to have both a blunt knife and a sharp knife, a sharp knife to cut the stick in half, and a blunt knife to proceed uh, 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 with the splitting of it. So it's an old tradition. And of course, I, I often like to say that accountants are stronger than politics, or, or accountants are stronger than Guy Fox because in, it was in the early 1800s when Parliament finally decided to get rid of tally sticks. They went down into the cellars and began burning them, uh, and the fire got out of control, and that's why we have the current Houses of Parliament today. Uh, so, so money is important, at least uh, in political overthrow. So that's the first bit, I guess, of our CBDC revolution. So what do I think? Well, I, I believe that we trade tax credits. And this is what real money is about. Real is the Spanish word for royal. It's really what fiat currency is. Fiat currency is royal money. And these are tax credits. And you can count on the persistence of the system because you know that I will continue to tax you if I am your monarch. And it's that circularity that provides the eternality to it. So let's uh, give you a quick few thought experiments for people who hate the simplicity of this. But at least this is a physicist trying to, uh, trying to define things. Well, if I, if I have 20 quid and I go up to the Shetland, 600 miles to the north, I can use it, can't I? No problem. It's, it's part of the British community. If I head over 72 miles east to France, I don't pay your English taxes. I don't need your tax credit. You know, go get it changed into euros. So that's kind of a, an interesting bit, defining it. And of course, this means that the British community is an important one. Uh, and again, we move back into politics when we look at uh, nation states as entities with a monopoly on the use of force in a specified geographic area. So you begin to see this bit where we're, we're looking at, at, at a structure of, of the tax system. Now, the other thing, the other little test is, um, I said earlier that communities can be coercive. Well, if you're not feeling a member of the British community, um, ring HMRC after this conference is done and say, uh, I had a presentation this morning, and I've decided to test it. I'm not feeling British this year. And I'll call you up when I am feeling British, and I'll start to pay my taxes then. Well, what happens? Well, it's, it's a very backed system. If you genuinely persist in that, and I suspect some of you are having problems even imagining a, a situation where you would persist with that, but sooner or later, probably about nine months from now, uh, two people will come to your door, handcuff you, and lead you away. Um, so there's an entire system of tax inspectors, uh, databases, police officers, prison officers, judges, jail cells, etc. So when the crypto crowds say, well, fiat currency is just made up out of thin air, it is not. It is backed by the entire system of the community. And it's the persistence of those tax credits that gives us what I consider to be real money. Well, that turns us naturally then. Yes, but Michael, what about gold? And not least, Michael, you happen to have sat for many years on a variety of gold mining firms, which is true. If people want it, uh, we'll bring it up out of the ground for them. But I have never claimed that gold has got anything necessarily to do uh, with money. In fact, uh, you know, there's a lot of work that's been done over the years about why is it that gold, has, and silver for that matter, have assumed this particular focal point in society. And I would say that it's interesting that gold seems to be, uh, where Schelling talks about it, very much a solution to a coordination game about how multiple communities interact. So you have this, and this is why uh, arguably gold is very much at the international level. Although William Booter uh, maintains that this is just happens to be the most persistent bubble, 6,000 years old and going strong. So. You know, NFTs, circa 4,000 BC. Uh, we'll, we'll see about that. Now, the bugs of gold are, are intriguing. You'll, you'll have heard them uh, many times over the years that it's really an inflation hedge, and that the difference is that it's backed, unlike fiat currencies. Well, I got news for you: gold doesn't come out of the vaults and handcuff me and throw me in jail. So I kind of think that the community basis of the nation state has a little bit more force in my personal life. Um, it's supposed to be uh, indestructible, but it, therefore it's also an inert metal and therefore it doesn't do very much uh, commercially. It, it is simple, um, but the returns, as I said, are pathetic. 
there is a limited supply, which leads, of course, to the crypto world uh, using the term mining uh, for the gaming process that they use, which is a good comparison. Um, and it provides you with some portfolio diversification. But at that argument, just about everything provides you with portfolio diversification. So you might as well be buying uh, tables and chairs and carpets and sticking them uh, into, into the spare spot of the garage. I said I'd touch briefly on the history of digital money. Uh, and I'm doing this uh, really only to point out two things. The first is you'll note that I date the start of digital money from 1976. And I do so uh, principally because this is when uh, Diffie-Hellman bring out their very first, uh, their very first paper on uh, public key uh, cryptography. And this is fundamental to the use of digital technology, uh, has been cryptography. And from that point on, we've seen a number of initiatives. Uh, many of you are old enough to remember Mondex, which was uh, a 1990 initiative by NatWest Bank. Um, and they were trying to get people to use digital cash out in Swindon, but they had a fairly significant, I'm trying to remember what the rate was, it was about a 2 or 3% spread, and the good people of Swindon were smart enough to say that they really didn't want a 2 or 3% spread on cash. Um, uh, we at Zien created something called Stacks and Sleeves, which was a, well, it is a blockchain, still going today as Chainsy, um, and on and on you go. So there's been a, a number of efforts, and I, I just sort of quit around 2017 at looking at them. But it is extremely clear that concepts of digital money have entranced and gained people's attention. Unfortunately, um, and this is part of setting the overview today, I believe that there are three myths we ought to just nail on the head quite quickly. Um, most of the space here is supposed to be brand new technology. And if you take the period of brand new as being anything, say, since about 1995, um, we could have a chat about it. I'll even give you to 2000, but by, by 2000, there has been nothing new. So we're getting on for nearly a quarter of a century of old technology that has failed to provide the revolution that we've been speaking about for so long. The second thing I'd like to point out is economics and speed matter. And thirdly, uh, we do have to look at the reality behind payments. Well, you'll be familiar with uh, this diagram. This is the diagram from the 2008 paper by Satoshi Nakamoto, which was published late in that year, uh, basically saying I'm going to be looking at a chain of digital signatures, and this is going to provide a system uh, that's uh, interesting and fantastic. Well, I believe that paper uh, was revolutionary in the sense of the mining algorithm, which I also see as a bit of a busted flush, but I think that was the interesting bit. The truth is um, there was nothing new in that paper on the chain of transactions. This is a 1976 applied for, 1978 granted patent to IBM for a blockchain. So before you begin to think this is all new stuff, it isn't. We've just failed quite to assemble it, not in a technical way, but in a compelling economic way. Second thing is that these have been used for many purposes, most princi well, principally that of authoritative distributed time stamping. Uh, this is an example of something called locks and also a, a variant of it called clocks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe. In fact, that was uh, put forward by Stanford University about 35 years ago, and it's how they record the scientific papers and the databases for those papers and continue to do so. E-gold was particularly interesting. Broadly, it was there. Uh, the, the history behind e-gold is a complicated one. Uh, but nothing really to do with the technology or the use of it, uh, really to do with its uh, troubles with the U.S. authorities and the government, which arguably, in short, brought a company down that was doing nothing illegal. Another myth we have is that this is all about payments. Well, if it's cryptocurrency, I'd be surprised. Now, many of you will uh, hail and, and point out to me that things are changing, and they are. But the predominant technology that we talk about is Bitcoin. And the example I like to give is it handles about 350,000 transactions a day at top capacity. So if we got 90,000 of us who want to go to Wembley, and Wembley, I believe, will hold just around 90,000, and we all want to buy a strip for the kids at home, buy the ticket, buy a sausage, and buy a beer, 
Um, that's 360,000 transactions. So if we all go to the stadium at midnight and hang around to the following midnight and uh, do those four transactions and wait until they process before leaving the stadium and then go home at about one or two the following morning, um, we could do it. Oh, by the way, the rest of the world would have absolutely no uh, financial capability whatsoever during that day. Yes, I have. And as I said, I, I realize that things are changing. Yes. But this is where they are. <laughs> no, no, the Lightning Network is working yeah. up, running, and... Working. Yeah. And in fact... Uh, no, it's okay. No, it's, it's, it's a fair point. But uh, in fact, if, if you go back to the locks and the clocks, um, and if you go back to the stacks and sleeves, stacks and sleeves was tested about 15 years ago at running 1.2 trillion transactions in a day. So it's been around for a while, is my point. It's the assembly that doesn't seem to be quite working. And of course, we then have the economics of it on both the uh, transaction footprints, uh, which, which are outrageous. And Ethereum has made some significant progress in the last year, which is another point that things are changing. Um, but it, too, is still running at around $4 a transaction, which is, again, an extremely high basis to be doing anything on. So. Um, Last bit I'd like to point out is innovation. Now, ministers love standing in front of the stage, and they need their stock phrases. The one I loved was at Mansion House last year. We had one minister. Uh, he came over, made a 10-minute speech, and said the word innovation 46 times. <laughs> that was actually over a minute and a half of his speech was saying that one word. You know, it was meaningless. You know, he, he, he might as well have said, you know, red undershorts or something uh, for all the sense he, he was making. Uh, and they also love rattling off, you know, well, you know what I'm talking about, AI, uh, you know, big, big data, you know, blockchain, you know, you know, that kind of wizzo innovative stuff. Well, um, so we're told that this is an innovative area. Um, and I would just point out to you, I would challenge that, not that there isn't innovation going, going on, um, but out of the something like 30 to 40,000 coins that have been issued, I lost count after about 10. Uh, we were actually doing some studies. And uh, we proved that 60% of the issuers were definitely frauds. That doesn't mean the other 40% were clean. Uh, and Boston College did a similar study at the time that we hit the 10,000. And they used a different methodology and also concluded 60% were definitely frauds. It didn't prove that the other 40% were clean. Now, most of those were just cloning Bitcoin or, to a lesser degree, Ethereum. And again, you'll see these sorts of valuations. So the market capitalization uh, of Bitcoin over the years. Uh, this is the last one I had in 2018. Uh, here it is in 2023. And you'll notice the rank order is very solidly uh, almost the same. So these other 39,999 coins that have, issue, have been issued since uh, January 2009 have failed to dent the market leader. And in fact, uh, if you look at it in terms of market capitalization over the ages, uh, that large orange area at the top is Bitcoin, and then you see the introduction of Ethereum uh, <laughs> taking it out. But Bitcoin has remained 50% of the sector. So all of this innovation has not dented Bitcoin's dominance. So where is the innovation? In fact, it doesn't appear there is much innovation. Uh, and as I've often said, most of these coins are, frankly, uh, gambling tokens and ought to be regulated by our gambling regulator, who is perfectly good at regulating AML and things like that, and no particular reason to, to do otherwise. And finally, of course, we, we have the narrative evolution, um, which, which has gone on. Remember, that the original paper in 2008 talks about libertarian money. Then it moves into payments, which I've kind of uh, slammed a bit. Uh, then it was supposed to be a monetary debasement hedge. In effect, uh, as a friend of mine, Byron Gilliam, puts it, there is a legitimate economic case for using it. It's effectively a put option against the collapse of the dollar. Uh, and therefore, you might want to put half a percent or 1% of your distribution into that. Uh, we then had the argument it's really an asset class. Uh, and you know, as far as I'm concerned, if you consider a casino chips an asset class, you're welcome to do it. I've got no qualms about that. Uh, then it's been an inflation hedge, which has clearly not been the case whatsoever, as most of these have halved in value since inflation began taking off. Uh, then we were told that non-fungible tokens are there. And lastly, the rhetoric has moved. 
obviously these people are far ahead of central banks and uh, and that's what we really need to look at is central bank digital currencies uh, and these are going to be better than them. So I think we've thoroughly kind of demolished um, the, the concept that cryptocurrencies um, are of much interest to us today, um, except as examples of human behavior and how technology can be assembled. So what is of use? Well, the first thing is I'm not slamming uh, blockchains or anything like that or any specific technology. It's more the assemblage. Um, but the history of this space is one of ledgers. Uh, we, we have the tally sticks up there on the top left. We have a traditional Dickensian ledger in the middle. And obviously, since the late 1960s, we've been seeing very much ledgers as databases. And ledger is important because ledgers have typically been an area where people try and dominate by creating a monopoly on the uses of information and the registration therein. And the challenge, I believe, in a lot of this area is can we use these decentralized ledgers to take away a little bit of the power of central third parties? Uh, I wouldn't go as far as Bitcoin because, as I, th I believe it's shown, it's gotten close, but it's very, very expensive to truly try and run a ledger with no central third parties. The minute you move into things with various types of approvals and proof of stake, et cetera, you're accepting uh, various types of centralization. Uh, all the way up at the top right, uh, where you have a central database. And in a sense, central bank digital currencies are very much about going back to the concept of a central database. Now, I know that people will come, up, come back at me on it, but what I do think is important in this space is this idea that these smart ledgers, as they're often termed, are available to us as constituting the Internet of record. Uh, I was back on the Internet in the 70s, and I remember a discussion that we had at Harvard in the spring of 78 uh, with Vince Cerf, et cetera. We were all discussing, and Richard Stallman, we were discussing how we could go about, uh, we had an Internet of communication, but how could we have an Internet of proof that we had spoken to each other? And we immediately came up with, uh, within about five minutes, the solution, and the solution was checksums. By the way, those of you in the audience, hashes are checksums. It's, that's what they are. A very, very long checksum is a hash. Um, and if you dig back into the literature, you see this transition to hashing. Um, and I have to explain to some of the kids at Imperial who worked for me, this is a checksum. And we sit there and we work out the mouse, and they go, oh my gosh, that's what it is. So we'd worked out that we wanted long checksums to identify. Uh, but the difficulty was more, again, economics. Um, you know, a 256, 256-byte uh, uh, 256 checksum was going to be a real pain for us because I only had um, four, 4K in my machine. So 16 of them would take up the entire memory of the machine. So we knew theoretically how to do it, uh, but we didn't know where to go. And you'll find, again, uh, most of the stuff is fairly old tech. Um, but I do believe that this Internet of Record is going to allow us to do a, a large variety of things and might have uh, an interaction with CBDCs today. Well, uh, moving towards a, sort of a close um, and, and trying to set out an agenda for us to discuss, probably the biggest thing to get across to some in the audience is that central bank digital currencies are emphatically not cryptocurrencies. That's, that's probably the biggest thing. And I know that we've got a sophisticated audience today uh, but I have found most conferences quite dull and boring as people wander around and start bringing cryptocurrencies in as if they are. If you're drawing a case or an anecdote from the way in which behavior has changed or something, I'm all for it. But they are emphatically not cryptocurrencies. Uh, a number of people have uh, written books even, which start off with the idea that it's all about blockchain. And if you read the central bank papers, not all of them, but quite a few of them, going back to the Bank of England papers uh, some time back, um, they say most clearly, we are not using blockchain. Uh, and, and why would you? If you have a central bank ledger that's yours, and it turns out that your published ledger doesn't accord with it, which one's going to be right? And then, therefore, why would you publish the ledger in the first place? Um, so there's no particular need to do that. The second thing uh, I'd, I'd like to move on to is um, these uh, four arguments, really. Oh, sorry, three arguments. Privacy, fractional reserve banking, and uh, taxation. So we've agreed that it's probably not necessarily blockchain. I know that there are a few CBDCs out there that do talk about using blockchain 
um, but they're very imprecise about where they might use it and why. Uh, the second thing they're definitely not using is consensus mechanisms. You know, they're very much sticking to a central bank runs the ledger. It is a central bank's ledger. So, oh, sorry, I'll skip this one. Uh, so the first one I uh, wanted to touch on was privacy. Personally, this is the debate we haven't really had. Uh, we haven't really had it in society. The banks have been skirting it, and I expect that today uh, it will become really interesting for us. Uh, not least that some of the supposed benefits, which are kind of vague in, in, in CBDCs, revolve around the idea of catching criminals and, and increasing the tax take. So how are you going to achieve a lot of that and also maintain privacy? So I think that is a, a useful point for today in terms of debate. I think a second uh, point of debate is, you know, is that how fractional reserve banking works? Um, so if somebody comes to me and says, oh, I've got a new CBDC, obviously, as most people are with money, my first reaction will probably be much more about is it secure, how safe is it, etc. And my second one will be, well, that's great, so I get an account with the central bank. Yes, you do. Um, but if you don't mind, would you not have the account with the central bank? Uh, would you please have it with Barclays or, or with HSBC or with Lloyd's? Well, why is that? Well, if you remove all of your money, then they won't be able to lend. Well, what are they going to lend? Well, they lend like, you know, at 12, 13 times what you've deposited with them. Right. Is that actually how it all works? Uh, and actually, the public uh, haven't quite grasped that. Further, as the public has become more risk averse and politicians have become uh, more risk averse uh, as well in terms of going up against the public, we've basically seen a situation develop where we have broadly uh, two approaches to uh, bank regulation. Uh, approach number one is we either move to force the banks to be fully capitalized, which is you know, narrow banks, as uh, John Kay promotes, or as I wrote 15 or 16 years ago, I call them then utility banks. I, I lost out on the terminology wars, but narrow banks is what you're looking at. These are basically just giant payment engines fully backed. Uh, they, in fact, hold the central bank digital currency themselves, but kind of retail it out. That's one approach. Well, the other approach is kind of where we are today. So the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse proves that governments these days are, are loath to actually take into account the idea of a bank going bust. Well, at this point, we already have central bank digital currency. It's just, in, you know, we're just one step removed. We, we don't have the account, but the, cent but the banks do, and our money is deposited with them. So if you take that point of view, we are already there just badly. And this conference is boring. And as a consumer or a retail person, I want it to be boring. I want my money to be fine. And this conference is really about the way that central banks in the background are trying to tidy up their systems so that their ledgers aren't quite so confused in their relationship uh, with the banks that they regulate. And there's also a little bit to do on the international side with how we interchange between them. And the final point I'd just like to say about today is uh, taxation. I did say to you that, uh, in my opinion, you know, we are trading tax credits when we talk about fiat currency. Well, think about it. I was in front of the House of Lords uh, committee in 2016, and they said to me, what are the two biggest things that CBDCs might change that we haven't thought about? The first one I said is, actually, you're going to turn macroeconomics into a science, because for the first time we'd actually know the, vo the velocity <laughs> and the quantity of money, which hitherto has been akin to sort of augury and uh, astrology. That's one bit. But the second bit is you're going to give politicians the ability to tax like heck. And the example that I gave was a tax on London. You might call it the Nelson's Column tax, that as you move closer to London and closer to Nelson's Column, the tax rate rises to 99.9%. And as you're out in the Outer Hebrides, it's 0.1%. And that's because we all hate London and it's all about leveling up, right? Well, you could do a tax like that with a CBDC uh, literally in an afternoon. And so we're going to be handing uh, a lot of power to our politicians. So to pull things to a close, um, gold might survive nuclear warfare. Crypto, obviously, is going to have problems with the Carrington event, a, a massive solar flare, uh, but might survive an economic meltdown. CBDCs are going to make us, in the, in the extreme technology view, that it is all electronic, susceptible to a Carrington event, and of course, uh, definitely reliant on our politicians not issuing too many tax credits. 
Um, the slides here will be made available to you, but I think when you begin to look at it, ultimately uh, between gold and crypto, uh, CBDCs are probably going to supplant both of them. And I would therefore leave you, if I could, with the questions that I hope would help you today. What is our community? I believe that's a point of some interest. What is the role of credit in a market economy? And I would outline our three big areas of discussion to be uh, privacy, fractional reserve banking, and taxation. Thank you.